gracious Heavenly Father, we just come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. So very grateful for the time that you have given us to feast upon your word together. I ask that you would filter out all of that which is foolish, seal to our hearts only that which is truth, that we may grow in grace and knowledge of you. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. Uh, on Wednesday, we've usually been studying through something that I like. Uh, on Sunday, uh, 2 Corinthians, we've been going through the epistle of 2 Corinthians. This Wednesday, however, I'm going to continue on in 2 Corinthians because um, uh, that's basically where I'm at in my study. So maybe next Wednesday, the following Wednesday, I'll come back and do something uh, different than 2 Corinthians. So we've been studying through 2 Corinthians. We're in the uh, fourth. We just moved into the fourth chapter. Uh, in chapter 3, we saw the vivid contrast between uh, that the Holy Spirit uh, presented there between law and grace and the and the highlight of that contrast was the temporary nature of the law. The revelation of God is not law. Uh, the law was just was but a passing covenant. The law was added because of transgression until the seed should come. But in the very addition of the law was the grand pronouncement of God's grace that the seed should come to whom the promise was made. And the Holy Spirit goes to great lengths to point out to us in both Romans and Galatians that the promise was made before the law was given. And few Christians, I believe, have stopped to realize that Israel was redeemed from the land of Egypt before God ever gave them the law. He didn't go into Egypt and say, okay, now listen, people, here's the law. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt... Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and so forth if you'll live up to the law. I will deliver you out of the land of Egypt. And he not only did not do that, he delivered them when they didn't want to be delivered. I mean, they weren't asking for deliverance any more than the blind man was asking for sight. I mean, to be sure, the blind man would have loved it if you'd have offered him money or or food or anything you might have been willing to give him, but he didn't ask nor did he expect to get sight. Surely the children of Israel in the land of Egypt would have liked a lighter workload, you know, a four-day uh, week, uh, color TV, uh, smartphone, uh, whatever, you know, a government support system. They would have liked anything that would have eased the burden. Uh, I'm... I don't think, I'm not certain that, that they would have liked the, the deliverance that they got. You know, we find them constantly complaining about it in the wilderness. They wanted to go back to the onions and the leeks and the garlics, the, the garbage of Egypt. They preferred Egypt's garbage to God's glory. This light bread, this food of God, they despised it. But as we sit back in, in horror at Israel, the average Christian today would prefer the garbage of Egypt over the glory of the Word of God. You know, who wants Bible study? Who wants Bible truth? You know, we want to be moved. We want to see and feel the spirits moving, taste the results of those spiritual experiences that transcend the realm of our daily mundane existence. And we develop programs that attract the masses. And we don't much care about what we t preach or teach. You know, if, if we spend enough time in psychology and in technique and public relations, we can have a real spirit-filled ministry. You know, spirit-filled being defined as advertising, PR, and charisma, but it's not the Word of God. Seems to me that that's what Christians are doing today. God said the law uh, uh, passes, it's going to be fulfilled. 
the, the seed's going to come. The promise was made to the seed through the sovereignty of God, not the fulfillment of the law, in order for God's righteousness to be absolutely verified. Christ fulfilled the law. He didn't destroy it. And now since we have a ministry like that, verse 1 of chapter 4, since we have this kind of a ministry, a ministry of liberty, a ministry of the grace of God, of deliverance from the law, of a fulfilled covenant of redemption through the death of Christ in our place, since we have this ministry of liberty, we have received mercy and we don't become discouraged. God the Holy Spirit anticipated that we'd get discouraged. Why? I don't mean to be critical, but if I had millions of subscribers, it'd be hard to get discouraged. The Holy Spirit anticipates me becoming discouraged. He anticipates you becoming discouraged. And all of a sudden I hear the greatest apostle that I can possibly imagine, one called by God to be a prototype of all those who follow Him. You know, I, I read in, in Timothy, Paul is the prototype of all who should hereafter believe on Jesus Christ. And the Holy Spirit says through Paul, we have a ministry of liberty and because of the mercy that God grants us, we are not to become discouraged. Why should I be discouraged? You know, maybe because uh, as we were told in 1 Corinthians, uh, the true messenger of the Word of God is the off-scouring of the world system. Maybe because you'd be hard-pressed to find any place in the Word of God, any reason to believe that a faithful presentation of this book will be widely and enthusiastically received. It seems to me, folks, I have two choices. Okay, I have the choice of chapter 4, verse 2, we've renounced the hidden things of shame or the choice of diluting or adulterating the Word of God, which we saw in the closing verse of chapter 3. You know, it looks like the choice is either relying on God's mercy and the liberty of the message to not be discouraged or to go the other way to use shameful tactics and, and adulterate the Word of God, handling the Word of God deceitfully. You know, the word, as I pointed out, was used for putting water in wine. Water mixes well with wine. And of course, the more naive and gullible the customer is and the drunker he is, the more water I can mix with the wine and, I, and sell it. You know, there's nothing wrong with water unless you use it deceitfully. But something's wrong with it if I sell it to you as something else. I think one of the ways I could avoid discouragement is to use shameful tactics and to dilute the message. You know, one way to dilute the message is to earnestly, studiously avoid the sovereignty and the power of God. Where that my preaching is primarily centered in man. Jesus paid it all. All that's left for us to do is something, and if we don't do it, it's not effective. Does that exalt God? No, it exalts man. Whether I accept Christ or don't accept Christ, in the end, my will trumps the sovereign, majestic will of God. Uh, that's amazing. you know. When the truth is, is that God is not biting His fingernails off, eagerly waiting to see which way I cast my vote. You know, will I choose heaven or will I choose hell? I see today an absolute, absolute avoidance of God's power, God's majesty, God's sovereignty. I think modern day Christianity is perfectly willing, perfectly happy, in fact, to have a sovereign God who can create and a sovereign God who can judge as long as, as He's not sovereign in between. No, you are sovereign, you know, and your key verse there is, is decision determines destiny, and that verse doesn't appear any place in your Bible. But it's, it's a very prominent theme. You just, you just twist the verses. As long as I preach any message that puts the burden on you, I can have a popular ministry. 
I think the surest way in the world to build this ministry and make it successful would be to ignore Scripture and appeal to your emotions and suggest that you have an ability that God says that you don't have. When the proclamation of this book is the revelation of Jesus Christ and what He did, the grace of God, the power of God, I think most people who pick up a Bible and read it casually from cover to cover and put it down and say, well, I, I know what its message is, human responsibility. I think those people are blind. You've got to be absolutely blind if you read it and you get that message. I think a, a child could read it from cover to cover and say, well, that's about, that's about Christ. That's about God. It sure ain't much about man. God makes the sun stand still. God makes the iron swim. That's why Hudson Taylor put it on, on his study wall. The sun stood, stood still and the iron did swim. This God is my God. But nah, nah, nah. Nah, we don't want a God like that. We want a God that we can fit into our own understanding, not a God of sovereignty and a God of power. We want a God who is a genie in a bottle you know, we're, if we rub it the right way, God will bless us. Rub it the wrong way, and He won't even come out of the bottle. And deceitfully, we've turned God into our servant. You know, we're the master, God's the slave. You know, when clearly the message of this book is that we are the slave and God's the master. I think it's clear in verses 1 and 2 of chapter 4 that my source of courage my lack of discouragement is either going to come from shameful tactics and a dilution of the Word of God or resting in the mercy of God. It's the easiest thing in the world, you know, to become a popular speaker, an effective minister. You know, we just need somebody who gets results. You know, it doesn't matter whether the Spirit gets results or not. Of course, we can always, you know, we can always couch that in good terms. But... Folks, when I begin to tell you that God tried this, God tried that, God wants this, God wants that, God's trying to do, trying to do whatever in your life, whenever I use phrases like that, I have reduced God to something less than God. The God I know tries to do nothing. The God that I see in the Bible works all things after the counsel of His own will. I don't see any trying. I don't see any hoping. I don't see any wishing there at all. I see Him doing what He wills to do and not doing what He wills not to do. I can't put any limitations on God. And it's so easy to let those things slip into the conversation that we have with other people. That's not the God that I see. All of that kind of language dilutes the majesty of the God who spoke the worlds into existence, who counts the nations as a drop in the bucket and the dust of the earth as, as, as nothing. That's my God. Folks, we have a problem if we don't face discouragement. For we are not as the majority who dilute the Word of God. I'm, I'm absolutely persuaded it is impossible for me to not dilute the message with the carnality of my sinful nature. It's impossible. And, and I only count on the Holy Spirit to filter out the garbage of Egypt, so that you folks might learn truth. It's not my bitter attitude toward modern day Christianity. It's this book that says most people corrupt the Word of God. And Paul says we are not like most. Now you can say that those are unbelievers headed for hell. I believe that absolutely violates the syntax and the grammar. The many is an expression used in the New Testament of, of, for God's family. I read that verse that, uh, that the majority of God's family are diluting the Word of God. That's not my bitter attitude toward modern ministry. It's, it's this book that says the majority of God's family are diluting the Word of God. I have a problem, however, when I get through verses 1 and 2 of chapter 4, because if what I've said so far is the truth, then the gospel should be supremely successful. 
You know, I don't need these things of shame. I don't need to dilute the Word of God. Yet verse 1 inferred to me that if I don't dilute it, I'm liable to be discouraged. You know, so the Holy Spirit starts right out by saying, you know, hey, you've got a super message. You've, you've received this ministry. You have a super ministry in the liberty of Christ, but don't get discouraged. That's like me saying to you, you know, okay, I've developed this pill. You know, I've, I've, I'm, I've designed this pill that you put in your gas tank. You just, you just fill your gas tank up with water. You put this pill in there. You'll get 400 miles per gallon of water. And I'm willing to sell these pills to you for a dollar a piece so that you can get a tank full of gas that gets 400 miles to the gallon for a dollar. Now I want you to go out and sell this, but don't get discouraged. And you'd look at me like I'm crazy. What, what do you mean, discouraged? Man, I think they're going to they're gonna kick the door down to buy this. You know, why should I be discouraged with a product like that? It doesn't make a lick of sense. That, that's the problem that I had when I started in chapter 4. You know, I, you know, I said, wow, Lord, this doesn't make any sense. I've got this super message of liberty. I've received it. Absolutely amazing ministry by the grace of God through Jesus Christ, my Lord. Why in the very sentence do you tell me not to be discouraged? Don't become faint hearted. You know, they're going to knock the door down to get this. You know, I'm going to have millions of subscribers. Well, the Holy Spirit, folks, already knows they're not. And He already knows that my temptation then is to help Him out some way, any way I can with that gospel of free grace. You know, if you don't come here and subscribe, somehow I'm going to work it out to make you into wheat God planted because I'm so burdened that you get this message. I'm going to be sorely tempted to re revert to shameful tactics and dilution of the Word of God because of my supreme concern for you and my enthusiasm for the message. And God says, don't do that. And don't be discouraged. I have to come to the conclusion then that the message is going to be received by His people. And I believe that's the conclusion the Holy Spirit wants me to reach. But apparently it's not going to look like it. It's very widely received to me. So here is good news with no strings attached. The good news is you are a new creation in Christ Jesus. The good news is not you could be if you wanted to be. Here you are in the wilderness. You come out of Egypt. You've crossed the Red Sea. One, now, one year now you've been in the, in the wilderness. And Moses calls the tribe together and says, you know, folks, I don't know whether, he, well, he called them folks or not. I have good news for you. You could be delivered out of Egypt if you wanted to be. Wouldn't that sound sort of stupid? And, you know, and like, there's Joshua saying, hey, Moses, we're out of Egypt. You know, you must have missed the city limit sign. You know, you're already out of Egypt. I think Moses here has been walking in the sun for too long or something. Folks, am I reading the, the third verse wrong or is the third verse telling me that I'm proclaiming good news to delivered people and, and undelivered people can't even see or, or hear it? I'm not telling the Egyptians that they could come out of Egypt if they wanted to. I'm telling Israelites who are already out of Egypt, hey, you're out of Egypt. That's my gospel. What is my grand news? Jesus Christ died in your place. You're a new creation in Christ Jesus. Oh yeah, but Steve, what if I'm not? And my answer has to be, well, if you can make yourself a new creation in Christ Jesus by doing something, anything, then it, it wouldn't be a, a new creation. Because you don't create anything. It's always easier to preach something man wrote. What the Holy Spirit gave us, what God says is, I have great news for you. You're already delivered because I was faithful to my promise. Now live like it. 
But the only ones who are going to hear that good news are God's people. The Israelites who are out of the land of Egypt, they're going to hear the good news. The Egyptians, Canaanites, that message, that, that message won't mean a thing. In fact, it's going to be foolishness to them. It doesn't make any sense. And now the Holy Spirit says to you and me, you don't have to be discouraged. There's a possibility that you will be. But you don't have to be. Your message is going to be received by God's people, God's children. It will not be heard by those in whom it is hidden. Since our gospel is hidden, that's a first class condition. Since our gospel is hidden, and the word hidden is a perfect passive. The passive voice requires an operator. The person didn't cause the gospel to be hidden from them. Okay, that's, that's the passive voice. <coughs> the fourth verse, in whom the God of this age has blinded their minds. All right, now there are, there are some people who believe the God of this age is Satan, uh, although there are many who believe the God of this age is God. I don't, I don't know that I can prove to you that the God of this age is an idiom for Satan. Christ calls him the prince of this world or age. I'm, I'm inclined to believe the most logical conclusion to reach is that the God of this age in verse 4 is Satan, but that doesn't necessarily mean that that's the same operator who did the hiding in verse 3. Here's what I believe. I believe the hidden of verse 3 is the veil that we had in chapter 3. The veiling that we had in chapter 3 was the veiling of Moses' face so that the Israelites could not see the temporary condition of the law, that, that it was in fact a passing covenant. So we have a veiled face in Moses. We have unveiled faces of verse 18 for those who are new creations in Christ who see that Christ completed the covenant. And now we have a veiled gospel. And I believe... The one who did the veiling in verse 3 is God. This is a passive voice. This would seem to indicate that the one to whom the gospel is veiled did not initiate the veiling. And boy, is that contrary to modern preaching. I have a sovereign God who sowed good seed. He tells us the good seed are the sons of the kingdom. An enemy came and sowed tear, and, and he got what he sowed. Tear. Now, of course, if you want to go beyond what's written and say, oh yeah, but but any any tear that accepts Christ is transformed, you know, somehow into wheat. You know, the sheep, uh, you know, goats become sheep. Man, I, I can't see that any place in the Word of God. Don't you know, we're told in the ninth chapter of Romans, don't you know that they who are born after the flesh these are not the sons of God. Well, let me see. Does that work? Adam, Adam and Eve got together. They had a kid named Cain. By the time I get to Jude, I find out that Cain's the son of the devil. How does Satan so tear? I don't know. He did a good job with Adam and Eve. They got Cain. Now, am I to stand stand up and preach to you that Cain ruined his life. Cain would have gone to heaven if he'd wanted to. How do you get how do you come to that conclusion? God calls him a child of the devil. God says they that are born after the flesh are children of the devil. These are not the seed seeded by promise. Now we as Isaac was are the children of promise. When did God promise Isaac to Abraham? Sometime after he was born? No. God promised Isaac to Abraham 14 years before Isaac was born. Yeah, but you say Isaac could have gone to hell. How's that? 14 years before he was ever born, God said he was God's seed. How could he have ever gone to hell? He certainly didn't promise himself to God sometime after he was born. Now, I don't deny that Isaac needed good news, but if, but if he never got it, he'd have still gotten to heaven. 
Isaac is not a child of God because after, you know, after he was born, Abraham and Sarah very carefully taught him in the things of the Lord. You know, I could, I could start a series. Let's, I tell you what, we start a new playlist here on how you parents ought to raise your kids and show how terribly Adam and Eve treated Cain and how lovingly they treated Abel. And, 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 and you don't know that, and I don't know that. In fact, if I were going to read the white spaces, I might read it different than, different than you. I think Cain was probably the most spoiled brat ever born to mankind. That's what I think. That he loved his mother and father. His mother said, I, I have gotten a man. Boy, did she, I don't know if she realized just what she had, was really saying there. God says he was a child of the devil. So I could spend days preaching that, you know, that by the way that you raise your children, you'll make them children of the devil or you'll, you'll make them children of God. That's not true. That is anti-Scripture. It, it, it may, of course, give you a lot of, you know, psychological tricks and raising your kids and there's nothing wrong with that if, if we'd simply leave out the gospel but folks that's not the gospel the truth of the matter is Satan sowed Cain and he got what he sowed a child of the devil and Cain did not ruin his life and now of course somebody says you know what, what kind of a God is that a God of grace and love who sowed his family and reaps it None of his family will be in hell. And I think that's fantastic. I, th I think a parent that so carefully provides and cares for his family that they're all whole and entire, you know, that's a super parent. Don't you make them out to be bad parents. I did not sow tear, says God. Oh, but God, there's tear there. An enemy did it, he said. Are you going to lay charge against God that He didn't care for the enemy's children? No. The third verse says, Steve, you don't have to worry about the proclamation. Isn't no reason for you to be faint-hearted. You don't have to use shame. You don't have to, to dilute the Word of God. You don't have to use PR tricks. The gospel is hidden. Since the gospel is hidden, first-class condition, since our gospel is hidden, it's been hidden in past time by God with the consummate result that it now remains permanently hidden to those who are being ruined. And I, I can't come to any other conclusion but that the third verse says that God had no intention of the good news reaching any child of the devil and that is contrary to most of the missionary efforts that I hear about today. I believe the fourth verse is the terror of Matthew 13, in whom the God of this age, Satan, has blinded their minds. I don't, I don't believe that Israel was a condemned race. They were blind. They were a hardened race. God hardened them, but they weren't condemned. I believe that the blinded here of verse 4 is a condemnation. You know, if you want to say, but, you know, but they, they became unblinded when they accept Christ. You go ahead and say that. The Bible doesn't say that. The Bible does not say that. Somehow I'm asked to believe that a dead, blind man can do something and now he lives. And now he sees. Seems to me like he's got to live before he can do anything. And I believe that's being faithful to Scripture. The Pharisees were blind leaders of the blind. The ministry of the Pharisees was primarily to the children of the devil. Yet God had His people in that religious system. The world is a religious system. It's, it's not ra uh, uh, rap music or disco dancing. or That's not worldly. Worldly isn't wearing lipstick and going to the beauty parlor. Okay? Worldly is one who's religious. It's a religious system. And, and the primary ministers in the religious system are Satan's servants ministering to Satan's children in whom the God of this age has blinded their minds so that they cannot see the minds of the unbelieving, so that the enlightenment of the glorious gospel of Christ 
who is the image of God, should shine unto them. The gospel brings light. Well, to whom does it bring light? It brings light to God's children. It's been hidden in past time, perfect passive, with the result that it remains hidden to Satan's children, but it enlightens us. It enlightens God's children. It dawns. The word is dawn. It dawns upon God's children. It does not dawn upon Satan's children. And blinded is in the aorist tense. What I'm asked to believe is that he's, he is constantly blinding and then there's some time when this individual makes a decision and, and now that blinding is done away. But this is an aorist, a one-time action, something Satan did. It's, it's foolish to those who are perishing. The answer has to be the light of the gospel of Christ. The, the light of the gospel of Christ ha, has no ability to transform the heart of a child of the devil to a child of God. It doesn't have that ability to, to, to take and turn goats into sheep or tear into wheat. It doesn't have that. The gospel does not have that ability. God didn't blind them. Satan did. Why is there a blinding of the gospel if the light of the gospel can't do anything anyway about a new nature? Well, what it says here is the reason Satan blinded them is because he was afraid that the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of the God, should dawn upon them. It doesn't say God blinded them. It seems to me there's a, a clear testimony in the fourth verse that even Satan... The God of this age recognizes the authority and the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and it's Satan who did the blinding. God didn't blind them. Satan blinded them because Satan was afraid the light of the glorious gospel, who is the image of the, of the God, should shine unto them. That Apparently, that was Satan's reason for blinding. Is that a valid reason? It was to Satan... I don't think there's any indication in verse 4 that if the gospel were to, to dawn upon them, that they would cease to be tare and they would become wheat. All of a sudden, they just stop being goats and they become sheep. I've got to reach the conclusion in verse 4 that Satan's reason for blinding was his concern over the light of the gospel. He did not want them lighted. Not that they could be lighted, but that he didn't want them lighted. If you say to me, well, is that a mistake on Satan's part? I say, yeah, I, I think so. Look at the crucifixion, the crucifixion of Christ. Satan surely wanted that done. God did it. God sovereignly delivered the Lord Jesus Christ. But surely Satan thought he'd, he'd, he made a great victory in the crucifixion of Christ. I read in verse 4 that Satan concluded he wanted blinded minds so that they wouldn't hear the gospel I don't read in verse 4 that, that if he hadn't blinded their minds that they would be new creations in Christ. There's, there is a strong testimony to the power of the good news. Our adversary thinks it's so powerful, the gospel is so powerful, that he blinded the minds of his own children. Satan surely understands the power of the gospel that we preach. Yet, why would Satan do that if he knows that terror can't become wheat? I believe Satan did it, and I believe the reason Satan did it is, is stated in verse 4. Lest they see. In, in Genesis chapter 3, we're told that God put enmity between Satan and man as well as between Satan and God. God is merciful and loving toward His own family. Satan is not toward his. Satan doesn't operate in mercy and love towards his family as God does toward his. In fact, God put enmity between Satan and mankind as well as between Satan and the seed of the woman. What I know is that Satan blinded their mind because he didn't want the light of the glorious gospel of Christ who is the image of God to dawn upon them probably thinking like most of Christianity today believes that if it did shine on them, they could see and believe. 
they could become weak. Where we now have the mind of Satan in perfect agreement, perfect alignment with the world religious system based on merit and what they're preaching. Look, I love you all. I truly do. Rest in Him. See you next Sunday. Thank you.